I'm doing cardio exercise is kind of a misnomer because any exercise involves cardiac muscle. Mark, there's this new fitness concept I want to ask you about called Zone 2 Cardio. It's the latest sensation. It's so important for health, peak performance, longevity. What do you think about that? Never heard of it. I, I, <laughs> where did they come up with that? I, I, I'm wondering where did that uh, concept come from? Oh, I know. We've been talking about it for 30 years now. Um, but we sort of refer to it as um, the MAF zone, you know, that 180 minus your heart rate, that comfortable... 180 minus age, one, the aerobic... Sorry, one, uh, 180 minus your age, yeah. heart rate. Uh, that, that area where you can um, do work comfortably uh, while carrying on conversation, sort of the metric we use about you know, whether or not you're working too hard. Uh, that zone at which you're most likely burning, you know, 97 to 98% fat as a source of fuel um, with the intent of building up your aerobic capacity by optimizing your fat burning and, um, and uh, capillary perfusion and all of the things that come with that phase of training. So it's interesting to me now that we hear, you know, uh, zone two bandied about like some great revelation that's come about in the last three years. Yeah, who made up the zones anyway? I mean, there's apparently zone one, two, three, oh, four, I, and five. Oh, I'm feeling like it was a, like a, a equipment manufacturer that had mm. different zones laid uh, out on a, on a yeah. treadmill or something like that. Trademark, yeah. trademarked all five of those zones. Yeah, right. Um, but the, some reflections that kind of counter this seems like an obsession that uh, you need to get in this many minutes a week of zone two to get your good report card in overall fitness capabilities. Yeah. Uh, but we also know and acknowledge that the cardiovascular system can be developed at all exercise intensities, including sprinting very well, in fact, yeah. strength training, and especially moving frequently at a slow pace, which now, I'm sorry, we can't use that term anymore. We have to call it zone one. So yeah. law number one of the primal blueprint is move around move. at zone one like our ancestors. Move a lot at a low level of aerobic activity. Yeah, it's kind of crazy uh, because if you look at uh, how we're designed, um, you know, in terms of the energy systems and in terms of uh, power output and things like that, um, you know, we have different systems that we're calling upon at different uh, levels of output. So if we're walking around all day or just doing low level aerobic activity, that's one sort of enzyme system, one uh, fat burning system. If we're doing at the other end, very intense, short glycolytic work. Um, you know, we're just using uh, just pure ATP for 10 seconds, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, in, and everywhere in that spectrum and in between, what's happening is the heart is being called upon to serve up the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of fuel to, to uh, clear lactate and to complete that activity. So the heart is basically responding to whatever level the brain chooses to engage in. The heart has no say in the matter, it's mm. kind of along for the ride. But, but what it means is the heart, i.e. The, I, the cardio part of what we're doing, uh, the, the heart is, you're doing cardio work the whole time. It's, it's you know, the, the, the term I'm doing cardio exercise is kind of a misnomer because any exercise involves cardiac muscle. Uh, Doug McGuff has a YouTube video called There's No Such Thing as Cardio, um, getting into this concept that um, you're, you're, you're calling upon the, the heart to pump at high heart rate when you're sprinting, but when you leave the workout, and even you, when you leave the gym from those rest periods in between your sets, the heart rate's well above resting yeah. from the time you get out of your car. Right. And so this, this training effect, and more importantly, the health effect of working that cardiovascular system with whatever exercise, including walking, which I think some uh, devoted athletes kind of negate, yeah. like, what's the purpose of that? Yeah. I don't even feel like I'm getting a workout, so it can't be making me better. But of course, that, that, that training effect takes place from the time you get out of your chair, yep. which leads us to the idea that getting out of our chair and moving around is more important, like you said 15 years ago, yeah. than going and getting into a zone two and, and counting it in your book. Yeah. I mean, I had a good experience with this this summer. I was in Europe for four months, and I didn't have access to a bike, and I walked anywhere from six to 12 miles a day. And here I am in Europe and I'm eating great food, enjoying the, the life, and I lost four pounds. You know, I just, I literally, because of the amount of work that I was doing, mm -hmm. um, I was staying fit just by walking. 
I mean, six to 12 miles a day is a yeah. significant amount of, you know, low level aerobic activity. Every once in a while, I'd throw a jog in there, th throw a sprint in there. But I was, um, you know, I was engaged in some form of that activity every day. And if you took the accumulated amount of work that was done every day, it might have been spread out over hours instead of, Perfect. say, a high intensity activity that was mm -hmm. spread out over 20 minutes or 30 minutes. But, you know, that area under the curve of, of expenditure, um, equ it equated to that. Um, and I, I really got a firsthand experience of how um, I got fitter just from walking. I mean, literally came back from my lazy France <laughs> vacation, eating pasta and, you know, having, you know, a little too much wine. And, and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm home and I'm fitter than when I left for my vacation. Every, you know, everyone else that was in the group that were traveling, of course, they were all complaining like, you know, uh, I gained four pounds, I gained eight pounds or whatever. <laughs> they, were, they were taking the, the shuttle while you were yeah, walking somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's a good point that breaking it up is, is so important. And then when we come back to this uh, seemingly obsession with these narrow ranges where you need to get this objective and hit this objective, we face yeah. the risk factors that you could call chronic cardio. Uh, another example from my experience this summer was I had a couple of uh, weeks where I did a lot of walking and some running over a period of two or three days. And, uh, and the accumulated amount of work was such that um, the, the next day, the fourth or fifth day, I was wiped out. So you know what I did? Nothing. I just let, you know, I let the body catch up. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a fractal experience of and, and sort of letting my body tell me yeah you can do more today and you can do more tomorrow and that's great try to do it but then take a day off and don't do anything and so I had I would have two or three recovery days in a row sometimes where even though I'd done a lot of work the prior days I'm like no this is just exactly what I need I'm going to be better as a result of it I'm not worried that I didn't hit my numbers for you know for every single day because some people you know, on our trip would mm. go, we got to do something every day. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to, mm -hmm. we have, this is the schedule. We got to stick to the schedule. Um, I'm, I'm more inclined to let the intuitive part of my body say, you know what, you've, you've done too much, back off. Or no, if you want to go again this afternoon, let's, let's do another five miles, you mm -hmm. know, hard. Um, so that's, that's what I would say is the ideal configuration of uh, exercise experience, which is to not have to stick to a regimented dogmatic plan, but to be intuitive about everything you do. And, and in that context, throw some weight training in there, mm. uh, get some, you know, some, some leg days in. If you can't get to a gym and do leg days, then do some, you know, I found some stairs. And so I did, you know, sets of stairs some days. Um, did some stand up paddling. So that was an upper body day. So I didn't, I didn't, you know, feel compelled to have to do a lot of, uh, running or walking on the on those days and i i really got a true sense for the first time in a long time i mean i used to be a cross trainer i used to be a mm -hmm. triathlete you know and i and but i remembered now what cross training was about and how it all <laughs> you know how it all comes together and if you if you balance it you'll you'll be fitter as a result yeah especially balancing stress and rest so i guess what we're getting at here is that you can chart up these zones one two three four and five but keep in mind that you're getting a cardiovascular health benefit from whatever zone. From whatever. And even the day that you took off, it only took you uh, several decades to, to awaken yeah. to that idea that, you know. I'm not a bad person was, for taking, hey, taking yeah, right. a day I mean, off. Uh, yeah. that's, that's still the mainstream programming yeah. in competitive sports that you pursued when you were young, and, yeah. and so did I. And also just the casual fitness enthusiasts, like you describe people on vacation thinking they have to go and, and lock into their zone too. So there's all kinds of zones, people. You can get great results mixing and matching, taking time off. Yeah. 